we are today going to be talking about health disparities amid uh, the current pandemic. And I'm going to introduce just very quickly uh, Nick King. Uh, Nick and I were just talking about his many affiliations at McGill, and there's no possible way that I'm going to get them correct. So let me just say that Nick is, uh, is one of the fearless instructors in the MPP program, and I'm delighted that he is. I'm going to turn over to Nick, and he is going to introduce himself correctly and his co-author. So uh, without further ado, Nick King. Hi there. Thanks very much, Chris. I'm Nick King. I am an associate uh, professor in the Max Bell School of Public Policy, as well as the Biomedical Ethics Unit in the Faculty of Medicine at McGill University. I will be hosting and moderating this webinar. Um, I will shortly turn it over to our main speaker, uh, Zinzi Bailey, who will speak for about 10 or 15 minutes. Uh, then I will ask her a few questions but we will leave ample opportunity for plenty of questions from the audience as well. So it is my immense pleasure to introduce Dr. Zinzi Bailey. Uh, Zinzi received a PhD in epidemiology from the Harvard School of Public Health. She is currently an assistant scientist in social epidemiology at the University of Miami, as well as the managing director at Health Equity Research Solutions. Uh, this is a firm that does consulting with municipal and county health systems, uh, helping them understand health inequalities and transform principles of health equity into practice to reduce, reduce health disparities. She's the author most recently of an amazing blog post at the International Association for Population Health Science website called Racism in the Time of COVID-19, which really does an amazing job of summarizing uh, a whole range of issues from data collection to actual public health practice around racism and racial and ethnic inequalities in health. Um, I think we'll put a link up to that on the uh, Max Bell website. And perhaps the most, uh, the real jewel in the crown of her uh, very storied career so far is she was a postdoctoral fellow in the Montreal Health Equity Research Consortium at McGill University for two years. And it was my great good fortune to um, work with her during that fellowship. So without further ado, I am now gonna turn it over to Dr. Bailey, take it away. Thanks, Nick. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining me um, at, in this webinar uh, focused on health disparities amid the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, I appreciate all the nice words um, and it's truly a pleasure to contribute to the McGill community again. Um, and, uh, Unfortunately, it's the COVID-19 pandemic is not very pleasurable to talk about. Um, we're truly living in a life-changing era that I'm sure will have impacts for decades to come. So I'm just going to delve right into this and say, um, let's do a recap of where we are and the basics of this pandemic. Um, Please excuse me for being a little bit US centric right now. However, I think you'll appreciate that. Um, I think the United States provides a case study for what not to do, not just now, but in um, for a period of a number of decades. Um, so essentially in December 2019, uh, we started to get those reports of first cases of a pneumonia of unknown cause. Um, they're coming out of Wuhan, uh, China, a port city of 11 million people in the central Hubei province. And, um, you know, now we know um, of this um, infectious disease caused by the novel coronavirus SARS-CoV-2. Um, and it was, uh, and it spread to such a degree that in Mar on March 11th, 2020, um, you know, it was declared a pandemic. And as this infectious disease spread, so did the racist and xenophobic rhetoric around its origins and instances of racial stigmatization and violence against particularly people of Asian descent. Um, that has grown as well within the United States. Um, uh, it's really like bigoted rhetoric that we have come to uh, almost expect from our current president. Um, and, you know, calling uh, this virus the Chinese virus has 
fueled a lot of sentiments um, and acts of violence, right? Um, and this is um, a kind of overt racism that is not new to the United States. It's just the newest iteration of ways that uh, people of color have been viewed as vectors of disease. And I don't want to harp on those things, uh, those words, because, um, you know, we can always conceptualize those words as a uh, right wing populist rhetoric. Um, however, I very much concur with Nelson Mandela's argument from 2000 um, that I'll par paraphrase. Um, it's never my custom to use words lightly. The silence of solitude makes us recognize how precious words are and how real speech um, is in its impact on the way people live and die. So I will fast forward from those initial days um, of uh, scapegoating or the initial scapegoating to where we are now. The United States has swiftly become the global epicenter of this COVID epidemic, um, pandemic. And I argue that in addition to more recent incompetence and leadership vacuums within the current administration, uh, deep structural inequities, namely racism in the United States, and the systematic dismantling of the social safety net since the 1980s have create, created a policy recipe for American, American structural vulnerability to the impacts of this pandemic. So this translates to the United States accounting for over 30% of the world's cases and almost 27% of the world's deaths uh, due to this pandemic thus far. Um, I do want to recognize that there's vast underreporting in countries less, with less developed public health infrastructure, surveillance, and testing capacity, um, but perhaps that's something we can get into in the Q&A. But when we're talking about something like COVID, um, if we go back to, well, for me, Public Health 101 by the book, um, we'd be pursuing a strategy of containment, and if needed, mitigation. So for containment, you will need to act fast when there's few cases, you know, the, the virus could be spreading exponentially and, you know, was shown to be spreading exponentially in the community for at least a month before you see the first death. Um, and by then, it's already harder to contain it. So you do that through contact tracing, wide scale testing, um, case isolation, um, and in a situation where you have no vaccine. Um, but that requires freely available tests, public health staff interview and track down cases, and huma humane isolation facilities for people who don't have them, right? Um, however, um, this administration did fail to do that. Um, and by any uh, measure, the federal government has uh, performed extremely poorly, uh, failing to provide a coordinated response uh, to the forewarned pandemic. Um, which resulted in severe inadequacies in testing and surveillance and initial results um, from the local seroprevalence studies um, indicate that the cases only reflect a tiny proportion of the actual people infected with the virus. It's just the tip of the iceberg. So in the absence of swift containment, we moved on to mitigation measures. Um, using physical distancing and personal prevented measures. Um, however, there are, a, we have to recognize that prevention strategies are not a one size fits all um, uh, approach, and there are structural constraints to access uh, prevention strategies, right? Um, and that's what um, uh, stimulated or, or catalyzed um, the writing of this blog. Uh, racism in the time of COVID-19, um, where we wanted to highlight not just the rhetoric that is going around, but um, thinking about what is being revealed with the spread of this virus. Um, you know, uh, Black and Indigenous um, and other people of color are overrepresented in racially and economically segregated communities with substandard housing uh, conditions, unsafe or limited water, if you think of Flint, uh, Michigan, 
and crowded housing conditions that make hand hygiene and self-quarantine challenging, if not impossible. Um, uh, if we think of different settings like uh, jails and prisons, um, there's a barrier to um, accessing those prevention strategies. And although not always luxurious, uh, staying at home in self-isolation is a luxury. Um, and so furthermore, um, while COVID-19 is indiscriminate in its transmission, its propagation within a society steeped in structural racism will undoubtedly, as we're already beginning to see, it will lead to disproportionate impacts among marginalized racial and ethnic groups in the United States. And this disproportionate propagation is heightened by an uncoordinated national response uh, to the forewarned pandemic and test rationing um, such that wider, uh, wealthier neighborhoods have disproportionate levels of access to testing, treatment, um, and survival. Um, Fisher Island, which is nearby me in Miami, uh, near to Miami Beach, has the ability to buy all the tested tests for their residents, have access to antibody testing, and also um, a secured funding for small business, um, you know, the small business um, stimulus um, under the guise of being a small business, right? Um, um, I'm not sure if they've accepted, but there are deep inequities that are very much present in how this is playing out. So I'm just gonna highlight a few things. So the essential workers with the most uh, frequent proximity to others are also uh, those who are less visible and more likely to be low wage workers of color. Um, Despite the reluctant and incomplete uh, release of data disaggregating by race, ethnicity, and socioeconomic status, et cetera, um, across the nation, we are seeing Black, Latinx, and Asian Americans overrepresented among COVID deaths. For instance, in Chicago, as of April 13th, Black Americans made up 29% of the population, but 67% of the COVID deaths. Um, while we don't have a, a very coordinated uh, system of, of surveillance to assess all the disparate impacts, uh, New York City and Chicago uh, stand out um, in their release of data. And that allows us to see a lot um, more on a more granular level, um, the disparate impacts, right? Um, and what we can really see is that racially and economically segregated neighborhoods are the hardest hit. If we take New York City as an example, in Western Queens, ironically in an area called Corona, um, the number of ER visits for flu-related symptoms, uh, which are characteristic of COVID-19, is over six times higher than the total city average. 35% uh, of total, uh, the total population is defined as service workers, meaning that um, they work in healthcare support, food prep, and serving or building, cleaning, and maintenance industries. Um, and about 61% of um, the people in this neighborhood are rent burdened, right? Um, and it's also the third most overcrowded neighborhood in New York City per the 2018 data. Similar things can be said for the Bronx, where you also see similar patterns. And this is not um, totally new because um, the Bronx has been consistently rated number 62 of 62 um, on the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation County Health Rankings for New York. And while we know uh, that um, the disparate uh, impacts that we're seeing, um, we know that they're due to a range of multi-level factors in, uh, including um, uh, structural racism mechanisms, Black Americans and other people of color experience higher burdens um, of pre-existing conditions that put us at higher risk for COVID-19 complications. We know that Black Americans and people of color experience structural barriers to healthcare access, including uh, residing in states with uh, no Medicaid expansion, drastic cuts to public health infrastructure, and the unraveling of the national safety net. 
However, like confirmed cases, uh, this is just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, COVID-19 is laying bare structural inequities and vulnerabilities that create very different conditions in which we live. Counties in the South consistently have had higher rates of hospitalizations and moderate uh, proportions of people without health insurance, as you can see in kind of the dark pink. Um, counties in the West have had uh, lower rates of hospitalizations and uh, lower proportions of people without health insurance. Um, and then there's a lot of variability um, where you say uh, 40 counties, two thirds of, um, uh, of which are in Texas, have both high um, uh, uh, hospitalizations due to chronic um, disease and hypertension um, among Medicare beneficiaries, as well as a high proportion of uh, population without health insurance. This is the context that we have. Furthermore, when we think about Black Americans, uh, both elderly and non-elderly, um, they are concentrated in the South primarily, um, and those also are the states, or you know, the over, there's a ton of overlap with um, states that have no Medicaid expansion. Um, this results in limited initial hospital-based testing um, and subsequent testing thereafter, and um, I think we're beginning to see um, impacts of long-term healthcare costs. Um, we've seen people of color that have been turned away from testing sites um, or haven't gone until it's too late due to lack of insurance, and yet our criteria remain inadequate for capturing risk. So, you know, how do we capture essential work where we don't know the COVID status of those who are coming to pick up uh, a prescription from the pharmacy, um, who are coming to a food establishment, et cetera, or um, undetected cases in our neighborhoods when you're asked um, when uh, you know, seeking testing, have you interacted with a known case? Further, the reliance on hospital-based, often drive-through testing, advantage those who have more resources. And then if people do get a test, there's a juncture where providers or health systems have to decide whether they, you know, those individuals get admitted to the hospital, whether they have access to a ventilator, um, whether they have access to a CPAP. Um, and here's where some of those pre-existing conditions, um, the criteria for prioritizing key resources like ventilators um, and pre-existing implicit bias disadvantage people of color. Further, uh, hospitals in segregated neighborhoods are less resourced with equipment, personnel, and financial flexibility, and people of color have uh, more pre-existing conditions and um, die at younger ages um, and have them at younger ages, which increases the risk of the complications, right? So it's a kind of circular process. However, while I note those things, I want uh, to um, take into account that it's not all about access to care, right? Um, the drivers of the coronavirus, um, I would say, and it's not even about people, like specific characteristics or comorbidities. The true drivers of the coronavirus are places and settings. Um, they are the policies and practices that produce um, the close living quarters, the close working quarters, um, lack of access to hygiene, um, hand hygiene and personal space. Uh, limited access to quality health care, under-resourced, disinvested, segregated neighborhoods. Um, here in the United States, racial and ethnic uh, residential segregation and the systematic disinvestment in lower-income uh, communities of color, um, the historical and contemporary structural racism in this country, um, or one of the markers of it, um, it acts across multiple domains and uh, through mutually reinforcing inequitable systems to produce these differentials in intergenerational wealth, education, income, exposure to concentrated poverty, to concentrated policing, um, over the life course and over generations to drive health inequities. And so I wanna emphasize that these drivers are the settings, the policies, um, these historically created settings 
um, the everyday prisons and jails that now serve as impromptu uh, death row um, for Americans, uh, crowded substandard housing, um, migrant uh, farm worker barracks, homeless shelters. Um, it's those settings, but the impact is on people and communities. This historical context impacts our current public policies and impact the lives of all Americans. Um, for instance, um, we think about uh, the 1980s and the Reagan administration, and um, while touting a lot of uh, similar rhetoric to our current president um, around uh, welfare queens, et cetera, um, there was a systematic dismantling of great society programs, the basis of our social safety net. Um, since then, American life expectancy rates have been pulling away from those of other wealthy peer nations. At first, uh, it primarily impacted marginalized uh, racial and ethnic groups. And so if you actually, if we had a graph here of um, life expectancy for black and white Americans over this period of time, controlling for state fixed effects, we would see a widening um, post the 1980s, right? Um, however, um, this, was kind of normalized over a few decades, right? It was uh, natural to say that um, there was gaps in uh, life expectancy between these groups. Um, however, it was in 2015 that we then see some dips in white life expectancy, such that uh, black and uh, black white uh, life expectancy curves seem to kind of narrow again, but not in the ways that we would want, right? Um, there's something that's happening in the nation that is impacting us. And it, you can't ever, in a society, uh, restrict those impacts to just one group, right? Um, and this is now a huge cause for alarm, which is rightly so, um, and it has not yet been uh, normalized in our society, um, like adverse outcomes for people of color. But it's important to note that whites still experience an overwhelming health advantage over Black and Indigenous people, um, as seen by the different scales of, um, of mortality rates experienced by these different groups. And I argue that stemming from racialized dismantling of the national safety, social safety net, especially in Southern states, um, that's driving some of this um, that we're seeing overall and with this COVID epidemic. Um, so, Thus, we are, what we're seeing in COVID-19 is consistent with our history um, and impacted by key policy decisions, but can be impacted by the policy decisions we make now. So with that, I will end and um, we can move on into some questions. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Zinzi. That was such a rich and amazing presentation. I'm going to kick off the question and answer with just a, a couple of specific um, questions for you. Um, I think you did a, a, a fantastic job of, of showing how a lot of the policies that have, as you said, uh, the policy recipe that has set the course for what we're seeing now, um, often had very little to do with health-oriented policies. And you know, this is a big, it's sort of social epidemiology 101 that so-called non-health policies really have at least as much, if not way more of an impact on health than what we think of as healthcare or health policies. So the structural racism embedded in housing policy, economic policy, where people work and live and so forth. I guess one question I have for you is, um, as, as you already mentioned, you know, we've see, we see health inequities and inequalities, race, ethnic, socioeconomic, across a, an incredible range, possibly all health indicators. Is there anything peculiar about COVID-19, anything in both the epidemiology of it or in our response to it that, that is in any way different, that is either cause for a special concern or maybe hope or something? Um, I really <laughs> <laughs> open it up to you in that respect. So that's a really interesting question because um, I guess as a social epidemiologist and I have a very historical view um, I'm seeing patterns, right, and repeating patterns. Um, a lot of the rhetoric that I'm hearing is reminiscent of times past, right? Um, the responses uh, in terms of immigration, 
um, the responses in terms of uh, what it gets funded and what doesn't. Um, I think that um, that is very reminiscent of previous eras, um, you know, um, far ranging, right? Um, however, I think with uh, the coronavirus, it's hitting so many different um, components here, right? And the fact that it is a pandemic, right? Um, I think um, the United States, while I highlight that, and that's where I, you know, have my basis and I have a lot of uh, data and information regarding the United States, I know that there are other um, uh, racialized societies that are experiencing very similar, um, uh, you know, inequities, right? Um, uh, while places like Singapore are, um, you know, highlighted for their swift response, um, effective response, um, how they have treated um, immigrants or, or people who have been marginalized in society um, impacts how the, the, the epidemic plays out within the nation um, sus subsequent to that. So I think there is something very uh, global about this particular time um, in highlighting inequities across countries, within countries, uh, within cities, um, where I think a lot of um, the inequities are laid bare. Um, where I think uh, we are at a crossroads is in um, the conceptualizing of what to do next, right? Um, when we think about opening up the economy, um, who uh, is put at higher risk um, as the economy opens, um, based on when it opens, <laughs> how it opens, what resources are in, in, in play, right? Um, and I think that the decisions made right now will have lasting impacts um, for years, decades to come. Um, uh, the pure devastation that some communities are experiencing and experiencing at higher levels um, is um, bringing to light all at one time um, the, the inequities that we've probably seen, been seeing over time. Great. Um, uh, we, we have some other questions lined up, but I'm, I'm going to use my prerogative to ask one or two more. Um, I wanted to ask you about something of a sort of catch-22 that comes with um, the recognition of and response to health inequalities. So very early in the COVID-19 pandemic, there was little, if any, data um, beyond men versus women, right? We had very little demographic breakdowns for data, but we've increasingly been getting more and more data. It varies by jurisdiction. I'll note that mm -hmm. Canada's sort of racial and ethnic level data is, is not quite as solid as the US and many other countries we have little or none. Clearly getting better and better data is, is absolutely vital to fashioning a response that can target marginalized communities but it can also feed into increased racism and increased discrimination and stigmatization. And, and again, I'm, I was trained as a historian originally, and you see this over and over again, that the more we know about how, how disproportionately marginalized communities are impacted by an infectious disease, the more the weight of stigmatization mm -hmm. falls upon them. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if you could just comment on this sort of catch-22 and, and what we can do about it. And that's the catch, this is a catch-22 whenever we're um, uh, discussing um, health inequities and what to do. Um, they're uh, depending on underlying, um, I would say biases, but underlying understandings of how um, disease, disease um, uh, causation is patterned across society. Um, we have different interpretations of the data, right? So. Um, I will see certain maps, the maps that I showed you of New York City, I will see certain things and I see structural racism and I can plot historical policy points that have led to what we see in New York City right now. However, um, other people may look at compositional factors, for example, oh, it's this person, you know, this group's culture, this, you know, like this is how they act or uh, certain behaviors around um, uh, individuals. 
And that's why I want to highlight the settings, right? The settings as being um, the key points of intervention. We're not talking about just sick individuals. We're not, the focus is not as sick individuals, it's about sick societies, right? And what we're gonna do uh, to make um, our society equitable for everyone in it, right? Such that our, the conditions in which we live are not producing such disparate impacts, such that we, it's not a question of just having enough money to access a test in order to have a, a chance of living. Um, I've heard of many people, well, not, well, I've heard many stories, but um, one that really called to me, which was, you know, um, the, a man who, you know, he had to work as an essential worker in a food establishment, and um, the approach was not, um, it, it had been so normalized or expected at this point, and um, uh, the settings had been set up, <laughs> um, it had been intergenerational, that the response was, I have to work to support my family, and my wife should take out an insurance policy so that if I die, there will be more resources in my family, right? So those are different choices between staying at home, working from home, and um, life and death. Yeah, that's, that's a great point. And you, the emphasis on settings makes me think about how thinking about settings also addresses intersectionality, which is what you've sort of been talking about all along, where often what we'll do is we'll say, you know, this is disproportionately affecting a demographic group. There must be something about their behavior um, when they are often have to deal with multiple in intersecting kinds of marginalization and right. a setting or location-based intervention you know, shifts our attention away from the stigmatizing rhetoric of it must be a group's mm -hmm. behavior. And it's much more, it's the locate, it's the, the multiple factors that make them more likely to be in certain locations and be exposed to the virus much more. So I think that's a really crucial point there. Um, I have more questions. I always have lots of questions for you, but I'm going to go to some of the audience questions. I'm just going to read them aloud. Um, from our question and answer window. So the first is from uh, Jean-Pierre McCready. Um, thank you for the presentation. I'm from University of Quebec in Rimouski. Our situation in Quebec is that deaths are happening mostly in long-term care facilities where uh, most vulnerable elderly are concentrated and Quebec in particular, um, upwards of 70, I think even more percent of deaths are in long-term care facilities. Mm -hmm. In these facilities, it seems, don't know if we have data about this, that staff is mostly women of color working in very precarious conditions, mm -hmm low salary, moving between many facilities, hired by private agencies. Um, yeah. What are your thoughts about the links between COVID inequities and conditions of employment of women working in the care sector? You are highlighting exactly what I have been, um, you know, talking around. I've talked about the generalities of this uh, COVID epidemic, but you're highlighting a key point of the intersectionality, right? We have a caregiving role um, high levels of frequent contact, um, caring, you know, proximity, um, uh, long hours, and lots of people in a congregate setting, uh, people at highest risk. However, um, the, often these women of color um, are not provided the same uh, PPE, the uh, personal protective equipment, that we often are seeing with for doctors or people with more established, um, uh, maybe higher prestige positions. Um, but these are essential workers who are with the highest risk uh, folks, right? Um, I think that our employment um, uh, strategies and our employment policies are very key to um, why we're in the situation that we're in. Um, uh, as an immigrant to the United States, I, you know, I came from Jamaica when I was very young, but my mother was trained as a nurse. And in that time to transition to the United States, what did she do? Uh, she worked in a, a, a nursing home. Uh, she worked in a, a long-term care facilities. She worked in, a, in people's homes. She, was, she would visit 
uh, people to take care of them. Um, and people who have more regular um, uh, or routine or structural advantage um, are not necessarily the people who are taking those jobs. They're usually lower paid, um, have uh, poor hours, precarious work. Oftentimes, uh, they're structured in such a way that uh, you're actually a part-time worker. So in the United States, at least, um, you don't qualify for healthcare benefits and other kinds of benefits while working um, a, quite a number of hours, right? Um, so that precarious work is at the intersection of gender and, and, and uh, caregiving um, at the intersection of uh, uh, marginalized racial and ethnic groups, and I would say immigration. Um, and then also um, who is caring for um, the people who are most uh, at risk. Yeah, I, the only thing I would add there is, you know, we're starting to see lots of um, ruminations online and elsewhere about sort of the long-term changes in society mm -hmm. around COVID. But, you know, there are certain lessons we can and should learn from COVID-19. And this is one that Quebec and other jurisdictions can learn, which is that if you have arranged caregiving in a society in such a way that some of the most at risk marginalized people are caring for our elders, this right. is what will result, right? Um, mm -hmm. And we could learn the lesson of really seeing the whole structure of caregiving very differently, and in particular about who's employed in these, in these communities as well. Absolutely. So we um, have a couple questions next from Brenda Lynn. Mm -hmm. um, I'll just read them both, they're, they're sort of connected. First, um, she's curious about the last graph of life expectancy by race and wondered how you would account for the divergence of indigenous and other groups. And then a second question is, uh, is for the epidemiologist in you, uh, which is, has anyone attempted to isolate the effects, sort of decompose the effects of race versus income, insurance, job, and so forth? Uh, knowing that there is intersectionality and these vulnerabilities affect non-whites disproportionately, but which of these might have the, the greatest effect on COVID-19 uh, morbidity and mortality, I guess. Okay, so I am going to start with the graphs. So if you, um, you can recall those graphs, you, what really stood out was the plight of um, the category we call um, American Indian Alaskan Native. Native. So it's uh, our indigenous people who are increasing, are experiencing increases in mortality over time and have been for quite a while. Um, I think, um, in the United States, they have been made invisible in a lot of ways, sometimes due to, you know, due to sparse data or other things like that, where um, we're not seeing what happens to people. And I think that's another way that we can be thinking about settings, right? Um, settings and experiences. So thinking about um, Native American reservations and what resources people have, um, how, uh, you know, policies were brokered between reservations, tribes, and um, the federal government, how that interacts with our state governments and um, uh, you know, officials. So I think there's quite a bit going on there, and that also um, intersects with the social safety net. Um, I think we could get really far into some of those uh, nitty gritty policies, um, but um, we can see that this is the cause for alarm, right? Um, then, um, with regard to the epi in me, so I would say that um, while it is very uh, tempting to try to decompose effects, um, from a critical race theory of perspective, um, I think we're always going to be underestimating the impact of things like structural racism. Structural racism is not just operating through this categorization of race, right? It's not just about identifying as a particular race. Um, it is acting through income. It is acting through um, health insurance. It's acting through the public policies that our states um, decide to adopt or not adopt. That racism is throughout um, uh, the society and so pervasive that it, it's almost a, a moot point to um, try to isolate um, the impact of race. 
we should be trying to highlight the impacts of racism um, and highlight those systems and those practices that have brought us here um, to produce these kinds of disparate outcomes. Um, I think rather than talking about is it race or income, we should be talking about um, why are uh, hospitals in uh, you know disinvested neighborhoods of color under-resourced? Why don't they have as many ventilators as other, other um, hospitals? Why do we fund our hospital system in such a way? Like, how do we do cost sharing? <laughs> uh, what, are, what is the best way to go about um, healthcare? So I think those are the questions, even as an epidemiologist, I think to have a consequentialist impact um, as an epidemiologist, we need to be thinking about the impacts of racism on people <laughs> and health, health um, inequities rather than um, trying to isolate variables. That's great. Um, <clears throat> next question from uh, Christine Blazer, who's a researcher at the INSPQ. Would you say there's anything new with respect to disparities showing up in this pandemic? In my view, all the already well-known disparities are appearing clearly now under the spot of COVID cases and deaths which doesn't make the situation less tragic. But can you see any new disparities unknown before? Can we learn anything new about factors driving health inequality? The pandemic seems to provide the perfect illustration of the deprived being the most exposed to and affected by a uh, health crisis. Um, I have a couple of thoughts, but you go, you go first, Cindy. <laughs> you might have more thoughts than me. Um, I think for me, um, in terms of things that are new, I think it's highlighting certain things with greater, um, you know, intensity, right? Um, as a person who has been tied to operationalizing structural racism and its impacts on health, um, I've been very much interested in the intersection between public health and, and criminal justice. And I think we are seeing more and more, it's heightened the attention on the role of prisons and jails in the United States in fueling this pandemic. Um, in the same way that we can think about nursing homes as uh, key settings for uh, fueling inequities, um, jails and prisons and ICE detention centers are fueling this epidemic as well. And um, I think uh, we are beginning to see or you know, those of us who have been here preaching to the choir, um, maybe not, but like, I think it's becoming more apparent and more mainstream to recognize that um, uh, jails and prisons are inequity multipliers, right? They're um, gonna magnify the impact of, um, of any kind of pandemic. Um, and even beyond that, it's gonna have impact on all of us, right? Um, people who work in prisons and jails are, they're deeply impacted. That, there's no separation between those who are in jail and, and prison and ICE detention centers and our communities because we work in those, those settings, right? Um, and I think that's allowing us to, um, in a very real, real way, recognize that we are interconnected, right? This, is, this pandemic is not impacting us all equally but we are interconnected in uh, the fight against this pandemic. I would say that. I think that's great. I, I had a couple ideas. The, the biggest one that strikes me is, um, is occupation. Right? Mm -hmm. I, just saw, I just saw a great little article. I can't, it was a, I think it might have even been New York Times. It was someone who said, um, I'm a dollar general worker and I'm now an essential worker who's putting my life on the line. I didn't sign up for this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then you think like occupational health has kind of been like on the wane. It used it in some ways it's one of the foundations of epidemiology. But mm -hmm. as as in general, the number of truly dangerous occupations has diminished. There are still many very dangerous right. ones. You know, it's sort of it's not sexy to study, but now we're really right. seeing with COVID that, you know. We, we have, there is a set of occupations that put you at higher risk. So working in a nursing home, but mm -hmm. also this idea that we have classified people who are part of the food supply system as essential workers, and they never assigned up for additional risk, but now they are being asked to shoulder an incredible burden of risk. Mm 
and they're not being paid anymore, right? No one's clapping for the donor child exactly. or the general workers. So mm -hmm. that is really extraordinary. And you know, they of course intersect with everything else we've been talking about. The other two I'll quickly name, um, family structure. So mm -hmm. living at home, you know, the people who live at home and are caregivers of elderly people, immunocompromised people, you know, again, it's not a group that we often think about, but maybe we should be thinking about it a lot more. We think of the social safety net in one way, but in, in many ways, mm -hmm. the social safety net is about, is about families who are experiencing precarity. Right. And the final thing I'd say is mental health, um, which is the immediate and prolonged impacts of social isolation on people with um, pre-existing mental health condition, mm -hmm. loneliness, and so forth. So these are, you know, I agree that 90% of this is just falling along the same, it's, you know, what Paul Farmer says, the biological expression of social inequalities, and it's the same patterns. But there are some really novel things here mm -hmm. in the sense of exposing social inequalities that we might have not thought about originally. There are still social inequalities. They're just sort of ones we don't normally think about. Yeah, I think we're having, we're seeing spotlights in different contexts. Yeah. Um, and I think even highlighting the caregivers, um, I would say that that has a longer history as well, because we can also say who, who is more likely to be able to afford to have a family member in a long term uh, assisted living facility or a nursing home. Um, there are people who are less likely to even have a person there. Their um, caregiver is their family member who may or may not have been asked to work, may or may not have been asked to uh, self-isolate. Um, if caregiving is uh, kind of within the family unit and within the home, the setting, um, it, it changes the dynamic of um, any recommendations. So we have a couple different questions that are very similar. So I'm going to sort of group them together into one. The, f the first is from uh, Nurusha Santanathan. Um, based on your expertise, what are the top three things policymakers in the U.S. and Canada should be doing right now to better address racial and socioeconomic disparities in the current crisis? Um, the second is from Anat Rosenthal. Um, hi, Anat. Thank hi. you. Um, Thinking of the future, do we know of examples where local, more progressive social policies have resulted in different outcomes? In other words, are there outliers we can learn from? So this is sort of the big policy question. What should we be doing? And are there models for what should be done? Not just the models for how to, you know, flatten the curve quickly in a general sense, but to respond well to social inequalities in health. Um, so number one, I would say, well, in the United States, we have kind of a more complicated story um, where I think there's a very urgent need to um, provide health care for all, something that's not tied to employment as our unemployment rates are skyrocketing. Um, I think there is a particular, um, as we talk about occupation and work um, and you know things that we call benefits, um, I think we should think of them as, you know, our rights as citizens or rights as, as residents of this country, right? So thinking about healthcare as a right. Um, and, you know, maybe there is some positive preemption that can happen from the federal government in terms of Medicaid and Medicare. I'm not sure. I, I think this is a time for policy um, innovation. Um, so with that said, I would say that, um, we have that delicate balance that um, Nick mentioned already around um, being able to recognize, number one, that there are differences, but not attributing those as characteristics of those people and the, those groups, right? So what are the ways that we can address some of the settings that are producing disparate outcomes and the policies that are driving those settings? So I would say that that's gonna be tailored to each of the locations, right? Um, in the United States, we have to take a deep look at a number of different things, um, from employment to uh, food service to immigration to uh, detention. Um, I would say that um, our incarceration rate makes us extremely vulnerable to the next pandemic. Um, there are a number of different things that I would say um, on that uh, standpoint. And then, but I think that's like also the 30 thousand foot view or whatever it is. Um, but um, I think 
involving communities that are most affected in the planning um, of uh, relief efforts or uh, policy or um, strategies um, is going to be essential for actually uh, course correcting. Um, it's not um, it's not sufficient to act upon um, marginalized communities because they continue to be marginalized. Um, I think bringing them into um, the decision making space, being able to um, have a broader uh, democracy, <laughs> is um, really essential for um, actually addressing these health inequities. Yeah, I, I have very little to add other than asking people about the likely structural injustices mm -hmm. they're facing. Again, I mean, I think if before the pandemic you had asked people working in nursing homes um, mm -hmm. or asked the people working in the food supply, are you particularly vulnerable? They might have been sort of the, the sentinels for telling us, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so I think, I think that's a very good point. Um, we have uh, a question from Mark Daku. Hi, Mark. Um, <laughs> hi, Zinzi. How do you think that structural inequalities will affect marginalized communities in the longer run of this pandemic, besides higher risk due to the factors you've already discussed? Do you see other ways in which marginalized communities will be disproportionately impacted? Um, if things follow the current uh, direction, um, I think um, marginalized racial and ethnic groups will be um, further marginalized economically, um, bearing the brunt of the economic impact of COVID. So thinking about uh, the economic uh, shutdown, um, I think that um, those individuals are number one, not if they're essential workers or not um, receiving hazard pay and are taking on a lot of hazards. Um, Long term, I think um, what we're not seeing or taking into account is that there are a number of people who have those pre existing conditions, and those pre existing conditions are likely to continue post COVID. Um, some people are not receiving the care that they need currently um, based on, you know, the, the medical surge of, of, of people within hospitals and not being able to, you know, do elective surgeries or, or procedures, or um, there's a number of people, um, disproportionately people of color, who seek um, their primary care through emergency rooms. Um, I think there are people who are suffering from many other things that um, we're going to come to see have gone um, unchecked, um, um, unaddressed um, because of this. Um, this uh, pandemic. Um, I think that right now hospitals are going to be um, looking to uh, recover <laughs> uh, financially and, and states are going to be looking to um, recover financially by, I mean, I, I can see in New York already, there are cuts to, to Medicaid um, and to how that is playing out in the state. Is that what is really needed at this point? However, no, however, without, with the absence of kind of federal uh, leadership and, and uh, action, um, there's no way to make the budgets um, uh, align, <laughs> right? Um, uh, Mitch McConnell is like, is willing to let all of the states declare bankruptcy. People are gonna be trying to account for all that money, right? And who uh, tends to um, be most burdened when things are cut <laughs> and we go into austerity measures? Um, there's uh, cuts to public goods, um, and that's kind of one of the mechanisms by which um, there has been a systematic a dismantling of social safety net because we're saying, oh, we can't do that for everyone. They need to pick themselves up by the bootstraps. Let's get rid of that program. Let's get rid of that um, funding mechanism. So I think. Um, without a big fight, <laughs> um, we might be heading down a really rough road. Yeah, I think, I think all great points. I just really want to just underscore your first point about people who have sort of comorbidities, um, pre-existing pre conditions, right? The whole point of flattening out the curve is just to reduce the load on the healthcare systems 
But I think the assumption is reduce it so that we can just handle COVID-19, but this just means you know, prolonging the time to wait for routine medical care. It may be elective, yeah. but elective right. is a matter of degree, not kind. Exactly. Um, and as you say, for people who rely on emergency rooms for their routine care, um, I think we're, we're gonna see the ripple effects much longer. And you know, one of my pet things is, you know, COVID related deaths should be, it's already hard enough to figure out the actual COVID related deaths, right. but the larger, the larger group of deaths related to the COVID pandemic is again going to be much more disproportionately felt among people who are already living with very precarious health conditions. So I, I just wanted to underscore that. So we end at two o'clock and we have um, a comment and a question and I just wanted to get those out on the floor quickly before we end. The comment is from Bonnie Zahavi. Um, there are a lot of things the U.S. does wrong, but one thing done better in the States is keeping disaggregated stats. In Canada, and particularly in Quebec, there's still a belief that we live in a multicultural post-racial society that racism doesn't exist. It's problematic that we can't track the reality of how the pandemic is disproportionately affecting Black and Indigenous folk, um, uh -huh. to which I just say here, here. <laughs> yep. Um, yep. You know, and it's part of the catch-22, right? The, the flip side of the more you collect the data, the more stigmatization there is. Right. You know, the flip side is the more you think that we're past stigmatization, the less you collect the data. So, exactly. Yeah. And the, you know, the more the impact because you're not monitoring. Right. Uh, and I think, um, I think Canada needs to have some kind of paradigm shift to recognize and have some self-reflection around um, structural racism. And, um, you know, we have to go beyond like the individual um, morality of it to the structures that have been established over decades and centuries, right? So um, it's not sufficient to say there's no racism in, in Canada. Like there, there's there's a necessity to be measuring these things. And um, uh, from a brief time, um, looking at um, incarceration rates in Canada, um, they're drastically higher in um, in Indigenous people. Right. And that's not just, oh, those people. Right. There's structures in place um, that drive those inequities. So that's an amazing lead into our, our last question from Sarah Claremont. Um, if part of what makes structural racism so persistent is that persistent is that racist systems don't acknowledge themselves as racist. How are policies that work to counteract structural racism possible? Is policy innovation enough, or do you think we need something more radical than policy changes to overcome structural barriers to health equity? Um, I will, for the short answer is, I don't think it's either or. Um, I think that, um, I think the most profound changes to our societies um, for the better have been a combination of policies and uh, social movement. Um, a connection between you know, researchers, politicians, decision makers, and people on the ground um, mobilizing, right? And I think it almost requires that um, in order to fundamentally change. Um, uh, structural racism, I think that there are certain levers that you can uh, push and pull on um, in order to start dismantling um, uh, structural racism. Um, sometimes that is universal programs, right? Sometimes it's dismantling a, you know, a, a discriminatory policy, right? Um, so there are different ways to, to um, pull on that. Um, there are different uh, systems that may be more um, uh, amenable to uh, intervention, but it has to be, we have to, really understand structural racism and understand that the medical system, you know, undergirds the housing system, undergirds insurance, you know, profits. So there's, there's inequitable systems that are mutually reinforcing each other. So we need to take a global view of that. 